Hello everybody and welcome to listen a lecture in the course of basics of marketing and sales which is part of the Lito courses. My name is Minna Maritti Askari. I come from the University of Vaasa. And I will be holding this lecture about integrated marketing communications. So, what is the structure of this lecture. I will first talk a little bit about marketing communications mix, then we discuss what is integrated marketing communications. We go through communication process, we talk about developing effective communication mix, and we discuss a little bit about promotion budget, and finally come back to integrative marketing communications. This lecture is mostly based on Kotler and Armstrong book Principles of Marketing, but I have added some other things there as well. So, let's look at marketing communications mix. You maybe remember that in the beginning of the course we talked about marketing mix, uh, and there we also talked about four P's that are product place, price and promotion. And now this promotion is about marketing communications. What is the defini definition of this marketing communications mix? According to our book, it is the specific mix of advertising, selling, personal selling, sales promotion, public relations and direct marketing that a company uses to pursue its advertising and marketing objectives. Let's look a little bit more closer to these different uh, communication mix elements. So, in this model there were five different elements listed. Advertising, sales promotion, public relations, personal selling and direct marketing. Advertising is any paid form of non-personal presentation and promotion of ideas, goods and services by an identified sponsor. It is important to notice that advertising is uh, defined as to be paid form, so somebody pays for it, and also there should be an identified sponsor. It's usually non-personal, so for example, if you look at TV advertisements or pub um, advertisements in the radio or in journals, so it's not very face-to-face -face communication, it's non-personal. Sales promotions are short-term incentives that encourage uh, customers to buy, uh, to purchase, to buy or a sale of a product or service. It encourages quickly to do some actions. It can be also a trial, maybe you taste some new food in the grocery store, or maybe you order a newsletter. The very important thing is that sales promotions always try to activate and find quick results. The third one is public relations. These are to build good relationships with the company's various publics by obtaining favorable publicity, building up a good corporate image and handling and or heading off unfavorable rumors, stories and events. Quite often the public relations are not part of the marketing department in the companies but they have their own department. Also during these times of social media, the public relations have a lot to do in, in many cases in many companies, so that is very good to keep in mind. Then we have personal selling, which we are already quite familiar of. Uh, the personal presentation, uh, personal selling is a personal pr presentation by the firm Salesforce for the purpose of making sales and building customer relationships. And those customer relationships should be long lasting and win win relationships for both parties. And finally, we have direct marketing. Those are direct connections 
with carefully targeted individual consumers to both obtain an immediate response and cultivate lasting customer relationships. We might use telephone, mail, email, internet and other tools to communicate directly with specific consumers. Direct marketing is something that uh, it can be quite easily calculated and measured the effect. So it's actually a pretty good form of marketing communications. So what is then integrated marketing communications? It is that we carefully choose the different mix of these different marketing communication elements and use those to tell about our message, our big idea to the, our target group. The definition from the book is that the concept of integrated marketing communications is something under which a company carefully integrates and coordinates its many communication channels to deliver a clear, consistent and compelling message about the organization, its products, services, brands and so on. So the main idea is about coordinating the same message in different communication channels. This, this gives us a nice way to start talk about communication process. I have here a model that is called a Shannon Weaver communication model that is a linear model and it has been developed in the times of mass communication. It emphasizes pretty much one-way communication and indeed many researchers have modified the model later on. However, this model is a great way to understand the meaning of encoding and decoding and those are extremely important in marketing communication. So if we look from the left, we see sender. The sender can be, for example, a company that wants to market its products. It has a message that it will want to tell to its target group and the receiver in the right hand side is part of the target group in this case. So first the sender needs to think that uh, what is the message that they want to tell, uh, where they want to tell, that would be the media part, but very importantly they have to think that how they are going to tell the message. Even if we have the same idea that we want to send, for example, that our product is more productive than competitors' product, there are a lot of different ways to do that. So to encode that big idea into the message that can be in some kind of media. The media here means all different media channels that one might have. So there's lots of different opportunities. So once we have the message and it has been uh, put into a media, for example, we have a radio advertisement or TV advertisement or we have a, a personal uh, sales force uh, making the message. Uh, there is a receiver size who always decodes the message. And that decoding means that the receiver gives meaning to the message that we try to uh, get through. And this is something that is really important in marketing. We have to understand that there is so many things that affect how the receiver understands the message. For example, what are the receiver's background, what kind of experiences they have, what are their values, opinions, attitudes, beliefs. All those affect how the customer, the receiver, can understand the message and decode that for themselves. And during all this, there can be a lot of noise, things that at interrupt this one-way communication process. For example, we are 
driving the car and we are listening to the radio and while there are advertisements coming suddenly we come to the city and we have to start being very careful about who is who is coming from the right and who is going to the left and that makes our concentrations to interrupt also we are watching a television and we saw advertisement there but some suddenly something happens and we lose the tv uh, altogether there's no sending anymore so that would be the noise around the message and the media that uh, means that we can't receive the message in this uh, communication process there is some feedback back from the receiver to the sender for example the receiver can send a response through the feedback to the sender uh, this feedback can be for example um, writings in the social media it can be attitude change it can be for example that the receiver orders a product or tries a product later on so even though this model can be criticized for being quite an old model and more about one-way communication instead of this uh, two-way or two-way communication that we have a lot at the moment i think this is a really good example of understanding how uh, what are the things that affect how the receiver actually can understand the process uh, understand the message and that there are so many elements that really affect how well we can get the message through. In our course book there are different steps mentioned in developing effective communication. It starts by identifying the target audience and this we have already discussed when we discussed segmentation. It talks about determining the communication objectives, for example, using cognitive, affective and connotative levels or Dagmar model. It talks about designing message. This is a creative strategy, meaning that we have to decide what is said and how it is said. We can also use something we call an IDA model here. We have to decide on content of the message structure of the message and format of the message then we have to choose the media this is the media strategy and it tackles about with questions like where it is said so creative strategy is about what and how and media strategy about where and even though in this book and in this slide these are uh, represented as one after each other so really they though these are the decisions that have to make uh, at the same time and in that we talk about personal and non-personal channels then there is a selecting the message source and finally collecting feedback and now i will go through uh, these different steps so we talked about the target group already earlier let's go to the communication objectives and really uh, we can uh, have objectives in different levels we can have cognitive level effective level and cognitive level objectives cognitive level objectives uh, mean that we try to um, we try to make sure that the customers will become aware of our product and they know what the product does so it's about awareness of the existence of the product knowledge about what the pro what the uh, product stands for what is good for it's very rational level the effective level has to do with affection emotion and feeling it has to do with consumer opinions their preferences and their attitudes and maybe also beliefs so for example the customer might say that i prefer this product over the other one which means that they preference the product they might say that they like this product or that they don't like this product but of course when we are talking about communication objectives we wish that they would like 
our product. Maybe they say that it feels good to use that product. It really fits my hand. I feel powerful when I'm using this product. So those are effective level uh, tasks. And then finally, we have the cognitive level, which means behavioral level. It can be, for example, a trial for the product, maybe the taste test. We go to the grocery store and there is somebody uh, asking us to taste different kind of um, spreads over the bread, for example, and, and we taste and, and that would be a cognitive level communication objective for that company to, to see how many people would try the product. It can be a purchase or maybe also a habit that we buy more often or regularly. For example, when the customer says that I have bought some new toys or I have ordered a newsletter, this is a cognitive level objectives that objective that has been met. In our course book, uh, Kotle and Armstrong take up this uh, this Dagmar model. Dagmar comes from the words defining advertising goals for measured results. What it is that is that it represents buyer readiness stages as steps that every customer has to go through. Uh, the steps are called awareness, knowledge, liking preference, conviction and purchase. And we can take this back to those communication objectives that we had just in the previous slide and say that, okay, these cognitive level objectives are the steps of awareness and knowledge. We can look that liking, preference and conviction are part of the effective communication objectives. And finally, the purchase is a cognitive behavioral objective. So when we are deciding on our communication objectives, we can use these, these different levels to, to try to make goals that how we want our target group to behave. There has to be a lot of people to be aware of the product, out of those, some, most of them already know about it. Out of those, people like it. Out of those who like it, some preference it. Out of those who preference it, get con, con, uh, are convinced that they want this product. And out of those who are convinced that they want this product, they make a purchase. So the amount of people that has to be aware before there's enough people who will purchase is a lot larger. And this relates to sales funnel that we talked last time. So we aim a lot of people into the sales funnel so that eventually there is enough people who will purchase and of course also repurchase later on. Another model that is, is very useful when we talk about communication objectives is uh, IDA model. In the book, uh, the Kotler and Armstrong take the IDA model up when they talk about designing the message. And indeed, it's very useful in de designing the message. Uh, the IDA model comes from the words attention, interest, desire, action and I'm, I'm sure many of you know this model already beforehand. All, also in this model we can see that there are the same levels, uh, communication objective levels, the cognitive, effective and cognitive objectives. So the attention is about cognitive objective, interest and desire are about effective communication objectives and action is about uh, cognitive objectives. So when we are designing the message, we can use this IDA model there in the behind. And next, what we have to do is that the marketing marketers have to think about the message content, the theme and appeal. 
This all designing the message is about the creative strategy, about what we want to say and how we want to say it. So, uh, the marketer needs to figure out the different appeals that they want to use. Uh, Kotler and Armstrong, they take up three types of appeals. They take up rational, emotional and moral uh, appeals. The rational appeals, they are outcomes that relate to desired benefits that the consumers want. Uh, when we are uh, creating a message using rational appeals, we might talk about the quality of the product, or the performance of the product, or maybe the effectivity of the product. So very rational things. But as you all already know, the rational appeal is only one part of the marketing appeals. So the next thing that they take up is emotional appeals. And this has to do about uh, stirring up or waking these different emotions. They can be either positive, or negative. When we talk about positive emotions, we might talk about joy or love or pride, uh, maybe hope. We may use humor to get out these, uh, these uh, positive feelings. But also we might use some uh, negative feelings uh, in our message. For example, we might talk about anxiety or fear or, or even shame. And of course, the idea behind these is that uh, we usually try to say that if you use our product, you will get the feelings of joy, the, the positive sides. And if you want to be sure that you don't get the negative feelings again, you may use our product. I'm sure you can see a lot of uh, examples of in contemporary advertising using f emotional appeals. Finally, the moral appeals are directed to the audience's senses of what is right, what is proper thing to do. They are often used when we want people to support, for example, social causes, for example, cleaner environment or equal rights and that kind of things. When we think about what is the key, what is the key idea, the big idea we want to say, it's often uh, something that we call an USP or UVP. It is something that makes us unique and different from the competitors. Uh, earlier it was always called USP, Unique Selling Proposition, but nowadays that we ha when we have moved to this value discussion, it has also been changed to Unique Value Proposition. So actually there's no difference in the content of the co uh, this concept. The idea is that this is something that we can promise. This is something that we make better than our competitors. This is a reason to buy. And you remember the is, gives, means model from the last time, so you understand that the USB or UVP, it's never a, just a technical feature. Or if it is, it's only for a very small target group. So usually it's not a technical feature, it is something that we promise. It's more to the means side. Uh, Kotler and Armstrong also take up some uh, message, message structure um, ideas. They say that the marketer needs to decide on three message structure decisions. First, we need to decide if we want to draw a conclusion to the uh, receiver, what they should understand from our uh, message, or do we leave it to the audience? Uh, the second thing is that, uh, do we tell only one-sided arguments? So that is that we tell the positive sides, of our product, or is it that we also tell about the shortcomings, the negative side, where we are not so good at? So is it more like two-sided argumentation? 
And this, of course, has a lot to do with which uh, communication mix element you choose. When you are doing personal selling, you might use a lot more two-sided arguments than if you are doing, for example, uh, TV advertisements. And the third thing they talk about in message structure is that whether you should present your strongest argument first or if you should leave it to be the last one. The message format means that you have to think that what kind of elements you have to have in different medias. And this message format is very closely tied to media choice. For example, if you choose uh, to have a print advertisement, you have to think about the headlines and the copy text, the different kind of illustrations, the colors and pictures that you use. Whereas if you are thinking about using a radio advertisement, you think a lot more about the different sounds that you will have, different voices that are talking, if there are one or two voices, and the words that they are using. And if we look at the TV advertisements, also you might consider what kind of body language you want uh, to be used. Are there certain gestures or, that, or expressions that are used? What kind of the outfit is used? The hairstyle? What kind of movement or postures there are? So next time you watch the TV and the TV ads, you think a little bit about these things. What kind of the things has, has, has the marketing? been thinking about when they have done the advertisement. So we had the creative strategy and then we have the media strategy. That means that where are we going to present our uh, creative output? And this is all about choosing the media. Kotler and Armstrong, again, uh, they divide the media into personal communication channels and non-personal communication channels channels. Uh, the personal communication channels uh, are such that through those uh, two or more people communicate directly with each other. And some of those are such that company can control and some of those are such that company can't really control. Our own sales force are face-to-face -face communicators that we can control in a way that we can decide together what what is said, said in the uh, sales meetings. But often we want to use other face-to-face -face communication channels. For example, experts such as doctors or dentists, uh, we might uh, communicate first to them and then to hope that they will communicate um, later on to their customers and patients. Uh, word of mouth is an interesting communication. It's about um, personal communication where the uh, product between target buyers and neighbors are taught uh, are discussed about. You might have neighbors, friends, family members, uh, and of course, social media. A lot of people want to hear first have first hand experiences from other people. Uh, how have you find this product or which product should I should I buy? So it's very important and becoming more and more important all the time. And another thing that has become very important is bus marketing. That means that uh, you have you you target different kind of opinion leaders and hope that they will spread information about uh, your uh, your product or service to other ones in their communities. And of course, we nowadays we talk about influencer marketing that has grown rapidly. There's lots and lots of people big and big and small with big and small target groups inf influencing their followers. And this is something that has happened in in last 10 years. It has really grown. And then we have non-personal communication channels, different kind of media that carry messages without personal contact or feedback. So this includes all the major media where we can buy some space. 
atmospherics and events. And here I want to mention a little bit more about the atmospherics because um, when you have a, a, a shop for example how it feels to come into the shop what kind of lightning there are what kind of the colors there are what are the sounds that are that the customers hear these all have to do a lot with how what is the customer experience in the shop for example we know that a type of music that we play affect how the customers behave in the shop or how we put lights on in the grocery store uh, that affects how the customers see which, uh, which which fruit to buy, for example. So it's good to remember. Uh, another example that might interest some of you is that there is research that uh, when when people were going to to have a small operation, so when they were listening to calm, calm music before they entered the operation, so they actually was they were healing better because they were not so anxious to go to the operation. And then we might organize some kind of events where we want to also promote our product. There are still two points that Kotler and Armstrong take up. The first one is selecting the message source. They note that the message's impact on the target audience is affected by how the audience views the message communicator. So the main question is that uh, the message source is credible for the target audience. Uh, so what makes a credible message? source. We often use different kinds of celebrities, for example actors or athletes and even cartoon characters. Uh, we might use experts that I already mentioned before, such as doctors or dentists, or sometimes we use persons that are part of the target group. Then we want to maybe promote these uh, customer experiences in that case. We might consider that uh, using celebrities is also has it also has its risks because uh, sometimes the celebrities do not live up to the expectations of the prank company. They might have some problems in their private life and that might be crucial crucial also for the for the brand. And the final part is collecting feedback and we remember that what we, what we measure that we get. So we want to measure the cognitive, effective and cognitive goals that we had set in the communication goals, the different levels. And we might uh, collect feedback on cognitive level, for example, if the if the customers recall the brand, they recall the, the advertisement, the effective level, what kind of the feelings the message has arised, for example, how they feel if they like the product or if they felt it's for them. But also, very importantly, the behavioral level, that what uh, does this really give us some purchases and trials and, and in that way money. So going to the money side, so there's also, or we have to set the promotion budget. And um, uh, in Finland, most of the companies use one to three percent of sales to their marketing communications. And there was this uh, Nordic uh, research project about how companies how much money companies use in their marketing communication and how does that relate to their success. There's an unfortunately Finnish uh, website called Siksi Markkinointia where you can find more information about this project but they actually found out that Sweden is the country from the Nordic countries that really uh, invests a lot in marketing communications. So um, it, it, it's, uh, that is one reason why they ha have been very successful, that they actually invest in marketing. Uh, 
So what kind of methods there are to set a budget? So first of all, there's this affordable method. That means that we decide uh, in, within the company that how much money we have to be put to the marketing communications. Often we use the percentage of sales method. Uh, so that means that we, for example, take the same percentage that last year of our sales that can be either sales now or the forecasted sales and that would be the money uh, for, for the budget. The competitive parity method means that we look at our competitors and see how much they invest and then decide on if we want to invest the same amount more or less. And then there is the objective and task method. That means that we set the objectives, what we want to gain with our communication, and we set the tasks that we need to do in order to reach that objectives. And then we count how much each of those tasks uh, cost, and that would be the budget. Many times the budget of course is discussed between marketing department and the CEO so that uh, there might be different views and then it can be discussed which is the best one. Uh, when we talk about promotion there can be also two different kind of strategies push strategy and pull strategy. When we, uh, if we are, for example, a producer of some uh, goods, we want to make the goods and then ask the retailers and wholesalers to sell the, those goods to the consumers. So um, this push strategy means that we aim to market and invest the marketing communication so that we have activities to the retailers and wholesalers and also and we maybe give money to them to have activities to the consumers. So we might have some advertising or sales promotional material in the stores. But the idea is that we as producer we push the product in this channel. Whereas if we have the pull strategy, then we aim our marketing communication more to the consumers, such as consumer advertising, consumer sales promotions, brand advertising, maybe different kinds of uh, competitions for the consumers, so that they will demand the retailers and wholesalers to have the product. And then the retailers and wholesalers demand the producer to give them the product because the consumers are looking for it in their shops. Nowadays, the retailing is so comp competitive that most of the times you can't live with just the other one of these strategies. But you can make a choice where you where you emphasize more. Do you emphasize more to push it through the channel or you do, do you emphasize more to the consumers so that you, they would start pulling, uh, pulling the products in the channel. So just before we finish, I still would like to come back to this integrated marketing communications picture. So the marketing communication mix comes from these five different elements. Advertising, personal selling, direct marketing, sales promotions and public relations. In that there in the middle we have our big idea, our unique selling proposition, our uh, promise to the customers, the message that, that we want to, to the receivers to understand. When we are integrating marketing, we want to think that which of these different elements we want to use. And of course, there's a lot of um, little elements within those, these big elements. Which one we choose, how we combine them, and we carefully think that our message stays the same in each of these channels. 
Uh, there might be some differences in the message. For example, we might have TV advertisement for a larger target group with a certain message and then we modify a message a little bit when we make it to the to the social media, for example, to Instagram or to Facebook because the target groups differ there a little bit. But the big idea stays the same. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, good luck with your studies.